If you've ever met someone who is genuinely thriving and wondered, what's their secret? Well, then this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the Be Marvelous podcast with your host, Marta Kagan. of the Be Marvelous podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am beyond excited to welcome my guest today. She is an artist, a filmmaker, a writer, a powerhouse in the industry. The film industry, of course, is the industry I'm speaking of. And she's simply extraordinary in her willingness to share her truth, to tell the untold stories, and to do it in the face of controversy, conflict, rejection, um, you name it, she's had to contend with it as a woman in, well, a male-dominated world and a male-dominated industry. And what's really remarkable about my guest, Deborah Campmeyer, is that a lot of people talk about turning their pain into art, but she actually walks that talk. And you're going to hear all about that today. From her semi-autobiographical feature films like Virgin, Split, and Hound Dog, which she wrote and directed and produced, to her more recent directorial artistry on shows like The Gilded Age and countless others, Deborah has poured her love, her passion, and her raw feminine truth into every frame. And we're going to discuss some of the controversies that she's faced as a female filmmaker before, during, and after the Me Too movement what her creative process is like, and why she's raising a billion-dollar film fund to finance female directors, among other things. So there is so much wisdom and divine feminine power packed into this episode. Ugh, I cannot wait to share it with you. Sit back, relax, and get ready to be inspired. Hi, Deborah. Welcome to the Be Marvelous podcast. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I mean, how could I resist when you send me this like hot fucking strip tease and say, would you please be on my podcast? I'm like, of course I will. <laughs> you know, I know what I want and I know how to get it. What can I say? What can you say? You're the queen. So, yes, I'm so glad that my strip tease worked and that you were here with us. Um, I'm truly honored to have you on the show. I'm honored to be your sister, your friend, to have gotten to know you over these past few months and to share with my audience your remarkable story and your divine mission around telling the truth of women's stories. Um, so, Maybe for the benefit of my guests who may not be familiar with your amazing body of work, would you introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. Um, I'm a filmmaker and a TV director. And I say filmmaker in that I write, direct, produce, and, and now edit as well um, independent feature films. I've made four. Uh, my first one um, called Virgin. Um, was nominated for two independent spirit awards um, in, I think it was 2003, 2004. Uh, my second feature, Hound Dog. Oh, and I will say also Virgin uh, starred a then unknown Elizabeth Moss. Uh, Amazing. And yeah. also I love the first movie was called Virgin. Virgin like, right? right. <laughs> um, she was 19. I also had Robin Wright in that film, which was amazing. Um, and then my second film, Hound Dog, starring Dakota Fanning, and again, Robin Wright, Piper Laurie, David Morse, um, that uh, was nominated for the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance uh, in 2007, I believe. Um, and then I made a film called Split, which was essentially my fuck you to the response to Hound Dog. Not just my fuck you to the response to Hound Dog, but... Um, also, another one of my personal stories. I consider those first three films like a trilogy of me taking my shit and turning it into gold is how I always talked about it. Um, 
My fourth film was the first film that was someone's story other than my own. It was called Tape, and it was uh, based on my dear friend um, and producing partner. Uh, it, it was based on her experience. Um, but I started off acting, so her her experience was also very familiar to me, but I was really telling her story. But those were four Me Too films that I made before the Me Too movement. After I made those, um, I had been trying for decades to get into TV, and um, we can go into more detail uh, further along, but um, I did get the call from Ava DuVernay to direct an episode of Queen Sugar, uh, and then followed that with two episodes of her next show, Cherish the Day, and then my career in television took off. I jumped on to a show called Clarice uh, for NBC and then over to a show, um, uh, Star Trek Discovery, and then went off to Budapest and did FBI International and then back to LA for Star Trek Picard and then to Atlanta for Tales of the Walking Dead. And then I was um, back in New York in my own bed doing um, The Gilded Age, which was amazing. I also, after shooting The Gilded Age, uh, shot a show for Amazon called Shelter and another one called Outer Range with Josh Brolin. Um, And then the strike happened and it's been a a pause, Um, but things are gearing back up now. Wow. Such a beautiful body of work and fun and pleasure. And like you said, taking personal challenges um pain Mm. and turning it into art turning it into gold turning into something that other people can watch and relate to and heal from and enjoy and then all the tv stuff which just is a whole other level of storytelling entertainment we'll just say fun um fun that's like the fun and the pleasure piece so i'm I'm curious from (laughs) yeah you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta balance it out, you know, mix it up. <laughs> um, but it sounds like the the filmmaking work, like that is really your, that's the personal storytelling piece, right? right? Whereas TV is like, I'm coming in, I'm directing this show that's not something that was your, you know, you originated, but you get to put your your interpretation, your spin, your vision into it, which is, I'm sure, a blast. Yeah. I'm really curious about, the film piece, because you said you made four Me Too films before the Me Too movement. Um, you said the first three were personal stories. And so I'm really curious about the storytelling aspect of it and what, like, what, what would you say is the, the theme, <laughs> aside from Me Too being sort of like an umbrella over it? And right. what was the, like, how, how, how did that come out of you? Was it like a burning desire to, transmute your own pain was it just a desire to share a story like talk to me about the origin of that if you would yeah I mean it was about my voice right there was this thing I had to say in a world that wasn't hearing me in a way Mm -hmm. I think is Mm -hmm. maybe the impulse right like you you could say I made all the films so my mother would hear me (laughs) oh my god yes i get that i fucking get that i have to say it wasn't conscious it wasn't like oh i'm gonna make a film to transmute my pain it was only afterwards i'm like oh right like i put a line in hound dog where charles says you could you know take what poisons you and turn it into something powerful and good right Mm -hmm. my character said that to me yeah and so it's really after making the films that I can say, oh, wow, look at that trilogy. It wasn't like I set out to make a trilogy. It wasn't like I set out to take my shit and turn it. Well, that's not quite true. I think as an artist, my impulse always was to like make art yeah. out of, I don't know, the pain, the rage, the chaos, the confusion, right? There was this impulse that I had to 
be an artist and use all this shit and make something beautiful, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was an impulse. But when I was sitting down to write the stories, I was just following the thread of the story, right? I was just... And it still works that way. I'm working on a script now and I just am sitting down and it's like listening as deeply as I possibly can to myself. It's like I'm taking dictation from myself, from the images that are pouring through me. It's sort of like, you know, when you wake up from a dream and if you don't write it down right away, it's gone. Yep. It feels the same way when I'm working. It's just like I have to just catch it, catch it, catch it, catch it, yeah. listen yeah. as deeply as I possibly can yeah. to myself, which is, you know, I think especially as women, not something that we're supported to do. We're supported to tell the story and look the look that that we've been told we are are expected to tell and look, right? Yeah. Um which for me anyway is so far for so far removed from my experience. Mm -hmm. And you know, I often talk about looking right now for a new paradigm, a new story structure that can really hold my stories. I think as a society we have to regrow our ears to hear women's voices. We've been silenced for so long, we've lost the ability to hear. The patriarchy mm. certainly can't hear, but even we can barely hear our own voices, you know, and I always say to women who are asking me about writing, I'm just like, just say what you have to say, whether you like whisper it out, scream it out, vomit it out, however you have to get it out, fucking get it out. Yes. That's what our world needs. That's what it needs is our voices. But like, so many of us, I grew up in the South. I was raised to be so separate from my voice, my true uh -huh. voice. Right? Uh -huh. and to find our way back to our actual voice, what a fucking journey. Yes. Yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. And in the process of writing my scripts, I'm, tr you know, it's like the journey back to my voice is always in a way my films are. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that because I think that's, you know, that's really the, the the juicy thing that I often talk about in these episodes or when I'm working with a client one-on-one -on -one is being able to access what is true for you and then being able to voice that and then being able to live into that. And we're so divorced from what that truth even is because there's not a willing audience to hear it because we watch other women in the world silence their voice and dim their own light. And so we follow the, in those footsteps and it, and it feels very normal and right. very natural. And so then at some point we wake up and we, and we feel stuck. We feel trapped. We feel, um, you know, like sick to the stomach or, or like you're drowning or whatever is the particular place in your body where it lands, but you feel it and you know it and you're like, ah, and then you're a grown up. <laughs> yeah, in my case, you're a woman in your 50s and you're like, the fuck do I do with this now? Like, how do I learn? So I'm really interested in hearing how you started to learn this because you've been making these films for a while. This is not new for you. I imagine, as you said, gr you know, growing up as a as a girl in the South, that you had that experience. And so how did you break the mold, I guess? How did you decide, OK, well, I am going to tell my story. I am going to speak my truth. I'm going to use this medium and this is how it's going to be. Like, take us back in time and share how that evolved for you, if you would. Sure. Well, it's funny because I think I've always felt the experience of being trapped, right? Um, my abuse happened quite early. Um, I think I was in a place of shame and silence, not sharing any of that. All of that, like, sort of uh, brewing, like, you know, like, it's like, um, it, it, if you don't get it out, it gets infected, right? It's like that yeah. kind of feeling. It poisons the water supply, basically. Yeah. And so, I mean, in a certain way, lucky for me, I was like pulled out of my environment. We moved a few weeks later. And so it felt like magic, right? I was out of that environment. Um, but this festering continued, right? 
simultaneously, I was just a weirdo, right? I did not fit in. And so the level of rejection that sort of was thrust upon me as a teenager, um, uh, I think in a way, like, helped me because Mm -hmm. um, I was so used to the rejection. By the time I was, like, coming to New York, pursuing acting, and then making films, It was sort of like I had my cowboy boots on and my fuck you attitude. And, you know, and that was all bred from already being so rejected that I didn't give a fuck, which, of course, is just Mm -hmm. a defense, but it worked. Right. And so in a way, when I got older, it was a kind of softening that that I allowed to happen. Um, But when I first arrived, it was more of a fuck you. I'm going to you all have told me I can't do this fuck you, I'm going to do it any fucking way, right? So there was kind of a gift in a way to both the pressure and the rejection that really had me in a place where I was just like, I don't give a fuck what any of you think. Go fuck yourselves. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I love that. And that is so, that is familiar to me. Yeah. I think, I think it's beautiful that you, you know, you found the gift in the rejection. A lot yeah. of people don't, you know, you just, it just crumbles you and yeah. shuts you down. And so I was 18 when I came to New York and um, I was pursuing acting mm-hmm. and um, for, for quite a while. Um, and I, I found that what I would do is, well, look, I always say acting saved my life because it was the first place I could really express my pain and my rage mm. because I didn't do that in the South. Once I had the container of the theater, mm. I was really like purging the grief and purging the rage. And I, I swear if I hadn't had the theater, I would have killed myself. No, hands down, no doubt. I was very suicidal. So <clears throat> the theater was this place of expression of that darkness. Um, as I can, and I was very good at it, but as I continued to work, I found myself because I love doing mm, what people in the industry would call the method, more the method, more of Strasbourg. I love taking my own secrets and putting them in the work and doing it sensorily. And, um, I found myself sort of at a certain point, just trying to squeeze my story into someone else's play or, you yeah. know. Yeah. And I was always sitting in this oak tree, weeping in my scenes. And when I say sitting in this oak tree, like right now, uh, the scene is I'm in a library, right? Because you see my books behind me and I'm on a chair yeah. and I'm talking on Zoom. But in the world of acting, I can sensorily put myself right now in that tree and listen to the leaves and I can like feel the bark on my back and I can immediately move myself into that world right I just did it it's just a little touch of it yeah I watched it that was incredible so that tree that I visited over and over and over the plays I was putting it in, I remember I put it in of Mice and Men once, right before she gets killed by Lenny. And of course, the performance was quite moving, but I, as like an artist, kept not feeling fully expressed and fulfilled. And I'll tell you the story in a moment, perhaps, of how I started making films. But when I was a filmmaker, you can look at that, you can look at Dakota Fanning in that oak tree Mm -hmm. and that's the story that i was trying to squeeze into plays or scene study class right yeah Yeah. and when i was able to actually put it in the oak tree with the story it was expressing that was when my soul was liberated from the experience Mm -hmm. beautiful that's it's a gift to be able to find a place to do that and that you were Maybe I don't know if you were aware that that's what you were trying to do at the time or not, but that you found it, you know, you found it and it got expressed. And I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about what happened with Hound Dog 
because I was just listening to the Q and A about you know the media shitstorm after that movie. So I want to get to that in a minute, but. I'm curious if you did you always know that you would be an artist? I think you said you said that somewhere in there, but I wasn't sure if like like when did you have that recognition that that's what she, who you were and what you wanted to do in the world? Yeah. No, I originally wanted to be a jockey and race horses. But mm. past like 4 9 when I was like 3. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Hey, I'll do steeplechase because you can be a little taller. And then I think uh -huh. I'm five, five, three when I was 10, you know, yeah. uh, I'm 5'11". So it was not meant to be that I was going to be a, a jockey. Um, but that was my passion, you know. And of course, also, I didn't we didn't have the resources for that kind of horseback riding. Um, so I would, you know, I had this field horse and I would like I remember like I'd ride her bareback with a halter and in jeans and tennis shoes, you know, mm. and I remember like uh, the field had this, it had a barbed wire fence next to it, but there was a highway next to it with the, where the, um, the, the tractor trailers would head down and I would just like um, race. I would essentially you know, <laughs> race them down, you know, down the pasture was sort of how I, you know, when I was, already you know like I said 510 um yeah. but anyway I was you know I went through uh, I I don't know if you saw my film Virgin but it's a film about my shoplifting days and and um I had you know I had shoplifted been arrested and I had this like epiphany. I was also, it was this odd combo of me. I was also a cellist mm -hmm. uh, and I was like third in the state and I played an all state orchestra. And like, I was like, I went to church. I was the head of the youth group. You know, I gave a sermon like, but like the night before I'm out, like getting wasted and feeling <laughs> like it was just this mess. And I remember complicated, complicated woman, <laughs> very complicated. And I remember being at church and um, this girl in the choir, because I also sang in the choir, you know, it was a whole thing, uh, telling me about how she went to the performing arts high school and she was in the, uh, I guess, musical theater program. And I suddenly was like, I have to go. I have to do that. And someone agreed to be like, my legal guardian, my parents gave up guardianship so that I could uh, go to the city school. It was a magnet school. Um, it was the School of Performing Arts in Atlanta. And so I had to audition. They wanted, it was my junior year of high school. They wanted to put me in beginning acting. I was like, no, I have to be in advanced acting. So I used my cello prowess to say they wanted me to be in their orchestra. And I said, I'll, I'll be in your orchestra. And they put me as the concert mistress, even though I was a cellist instead of a, a violinist. And I said, I will play in your orchestra only if I can be in advanced acting. <laughs> so you were already doing the seduction stuff. Can you send them a striptease video, though, is the question. I didn't, no, I didn't. I was a little, at that point, I was a little more hostile than, than. <laughs> Uh, it was more, I was working my fuck you attitude. But funny yeah. thing was I got into the acting program and it was, you know, I think that the acting teacher resented it and didn't put me in a single play. <laughs> anyway, it was sort of in that minute of like, like being arrested, changing schools, going into the performing arts for school for two years. And then, you know, I auditioned for schools in New York. Uh, to be an actress. And that's what brought me to New York to pursue acting. And I was at the National Shakespeare Conservatory and, um, you know, really pursuing that as hard as I could. So it was really like a conscious, I'm going to be an artist. It was all after I found acting and I became super passionate about it. And actually this acting teacher in Atlanta in high school was like very, very, his name is Tim Habiger and he was very serious about it. And we, we read Stanislavski and we went to the movie theater and saw, I mean, it was the first time in my life I saw 
you know, um, 400 Blows. I saw La Strada. I saw all these foreign films. And it was just like my mind exploded, right? It was, it, I, I just, you know, thought of acting, I suppose, as a way of escaping. And suddenly it was this uh, way to be an artist. And that was the introduction for me. That teacher really introduced me to the idea of being an artist. And suddenly it was my passion. Suddenly it's what I had to do was be an actor, be an artist. Um, yeah. And it was really in the process of um, trying to get an acting job that I made my for first short film and um, was like, oh, <laughs> and directed and starred in it. And it was like the most alive I'd ever felt in my life, those six weeks of making the short. And it was like, mm -hmm. oh, this is, this is my path. This uh, is it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so so that path leads you to start making this trilogy, Virgin, and then Hound Dog. And Hound Dog is the one I wanted to spend a few minutes on because I know, and this might be true for all three films, so correct me if, if that's the case, but for Hound Dog, um, you it's a story about you, or it's it's your story, I should say, not about you, but it's your story. Um, fictionalized in places, starring Dakota Fanning. And she was 12 at the time. Yeah. And from my understanding, the controversy around the film started with the fact that there's a rape scene in it mm -hmm. um, that was not, you know, obviously no one was actually raped in the filming of this movie. Um, but because Dakota was so young at the time, somehow that became, and this was pre-Me Too, so that became a lightning rod for pushback. And I'll let you tell the story from there. But it, it, my, the question I want to weave into uh, this, this topic is, how did it feel to like tell your story? And here you are giving voice, right? Like that thing we were saying before about telling your truth and finding your voice. And then the pushback is so strong and so focused on how you're not allowed to tell this because it happened as a young age, at a young age and p.s that's how it actually happened right so i'm really curious about that if you would share a little bit on that with us yeah it was excruciating it was like having my child killed before my eyes so mm. perfect because it was it was my story i had definitely fictionalized it and i hadn't come out at the time that it was my story and I remember at a certain point, it was advised that I do that. And I was not ready to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, <clears throat> when, when the controversy started, we just had a few days of filming left. Yeah. Um, and it, it started because there was a, unbeknownst to me, a finder of the some of the financing mm -hmm. hadn't been paid as finder's fee yet. It was like, I think 75 grand, something like that. Yeah. And he had gone to the producers and we were just really tight on money. And they told him he's going to have to wait. And he had said to them, you pay me my finder's fee or I'm going to the press. And they said, fuck you. And again, I knew none of this. I was on set working. Um, so he went to the press. It was either, I can't even remember now, it was the Daily News or New York Post. I, I don't remember which one, but um, he told the reporter that Dakota Fanning was in an, an explicit rape scene where she was nude and that he was the sole producer. <laughs> so he had his name in the press with this statement and it went like wildfire. That mm -hmm. night on CNN, it was like, there was some poll they did of like, should a 12 year old be in a rape scene? America says no. You know, it was just a nightmare. And mm. it really snowballed from there. And <clears throat> there were activist groups getting involved. There were petitions to have me and Dakota's mother arrested for child pornography. Mm. Um, it was just crazy madness. And, you know, there was also um, a whole other level of like infighting between my investors and they were going to seize that the computers with the edit on it. 
I ended up sort of going underground. They thought they had the material, but I copied it all and I kept editing underground, um, submitted it to Sundance. We got into Sundance, which then brought all my investors back. Um, but this controversy was just snowballing. And so at a certain point, I took like the roughest cut you could take, which was like what ended up in the film um, was like, I don't know, two seconds of Dakota's face. And there was 30 seconds of it that was so fucking powerful. I put that in. There were scenes that I was forced in order to keep the rape scene in. I had to take out a scene where Llewellyn, Dakota's character, watches her father masturbating. There was a scene where she makes the two kids get naked and ties a snake around them. There were some other provocative scenes that ended up coming. But I put all of that into a cut. And we took it to the district attorney in Wilmington, North Carolina, where the film would have been prosecuted and mm -hmm. the filmmakers. He watched it, <clears throat> wrote on, you know, government letterhead that he was not going to pursue, prosecute the film or the filmmakers. And then he said, you know, thank you for making it. He said, we prosecute the real thing every single day. They had literally just imprisoned a father who had impregnated his 10-year-old daughter. Not one person called their offices about that. But they got 20 to 40 calls a day for month after month after month to prosecute me in the film. And I will say, like, I wish someone smarter than me could do some sort of, you know, piece about this because it was really the phenomena around, oh, we're not going to talk about the real thing, but you're not allowed to speak this truth out loud. Yeah. Shoot the messenger, right? Shoot the messenger. And then, <clears throat> you know, we went to Sundance. I remember I was getting ready to head to the screening. I get a call from the head of Sundance or one, the programmer at Sundance at the time saying, Deborah, you need to get a lawyer. Um, you're going to be arrested after the screening. Yeah. And my daughter, Sophia, you know, she was six, five. She was five. And um, she was there with me. And so I had to call my ex-husband and say, you got to get on a plane and come out. And, you know, I'm getting ready to go to the screening. And then I get another call back saying, oh, hold that. You're not going to be arrested. The uh, Utah it wasn't the district attorney. It was like the attorney general of Utah. Just watch your film. And he said he's not prosecuting you. There's not going to be any arrest. He recommends anyone who deals with this issue, watch this film as an educational film. Hmm. Go on, you know, you're not going to be arrested. However, <clears throat> there are death threats and bomb threats. So the FBI is going to escort you. Jesus. <laughs> so. Literally, I remember it was so crazy. We were there and I remember Dakota and I were in a small room and I had to go to the bathroom. And so like they took me, there were dogs that smelled all the garbage cans and it felt like you were in, oh, a, no. na you're in a national movie. Like they were going around the corners with their guns. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the works. It was the works. And then they clear the, you know, this, the, the, the theater was cleared out and the dogs sniffed and they placed yeah. it in and put the guards around. It was crazy, right? So, so what do you make of that, Deborah? Like the, what do you make of the fact that, you know, here, here's the story that is, and maybe people didn't know it was true. It's kind of irrelevant, but the point is it's a story that is not brand new. It is not unfamiliar. It happens all the time. Sure. And as a society at the time, we don't want to talk about it right? We make the arrests or whatever's happening, but we, we don't want to talk about it. And then people are talking about it, but under the guise of protecting an actress who's also young and, and not actually being harmed. No. I can't imagine that anyone actually thought that that's what was happening, that it was more about exposure to the subject matter, you know, just like the context, even if there's not actual at just like walking the edge and the discomfort. So I'm just curious, like, what do you make out of that? Like the whole fucking thing? What, what's that about? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure. I do know, like, I always say like when, 
when an actor in a film gets their head blown off. Nobody's running around saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, was was her head actually blown off? Yeah. But he does that, right? But like every article that came out was like Dakota Fanning raped in movie. You know, it's like, no, she wasn't. Actually, I shot her foot tripping over a log. I shot a boy unzipping his pants. I shoot her face in pain. You know, and actually it wasn't, the direction wasn't imagine you're being raped. Mm -hmm. Direction was you're being stung by a bee. Mm -hmm. But your hands are tied and you can't get it off of your body. Yep. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it was funny because after that scene, Dakota went out on the bridge and was dancing because she knew she nailed it. I uh-huh. mean, it's unfucking believable. And I grabbed my my best friend and producer Ray and took her into the woods with me. And I grabbed a big ass stick and I hit a tree and screamed and hit the tree and screamed. Uh-huh. I mean, I was the one who was like holding what that was about, not to. Right. Clean up. Right. Oh. Right. And so, um, you know, and it was it was wild how the audiences at Sundance were so beautifully grateful. I had a mother there say she brought her 16 year old daughter back to another night, you know, standing ovations. The critics screening, which I wasn't allowed to go to, but I was told afterwards it was booed. Mm. And so there was this crazy, like, you know, it it was just like out of sync how, like, the critics killed the film. It's got 16% or 19% on Rotten Tomatoes. That's unheard of. That's crazy. Yeah, that makes zero sense. (laughs) And then at the same time, people were coming up to me, thanking me for making the film. I had this older man. I was on a bus in Park City and this older man came up to me and he, and he said, I saw your film. He actually had a thick accent. He was like, I was so angry at you for making that film. I wasn't going to watch it. I was so angry at you for making that film. But I'm so grateful I saw it because you helped me face something in my life I'd never faced before. Mm. And I received so many letters, emails, ma- you know, letters in the mail from women saying, thank you for telling my story. Thank you for telling my story. Thank you for telling my story. And the critics were saying it's over the top, it's cliche. And then the audience was saying, thank you for telling my story. Thank you. Especially Southern women were like, this is not over the top. This is how it is, you know? And um, it was just really wild and crazy and painful. And you know, it, it killed all of the distribution deals. It, mm. it, uh, you know, sadly, Variety came out first. Uh, I don't actually re- read the reviews. I have whoever my partner is at the time read them and tell me. My partner at the time came in the room sobbing. So I was like, okay, okay. I'll pick it up. <laughs> um, but apparently the Hollywood Reporter was a really great review, but Variety came out first and everyone around the world was just waiting for that and pounced on it and used that as, you know, the review they fall, fall, fell in line uh, yeah. with. You know, I don't know. It's... Look, the, the majority of sexual violence, especially against young women and young men, for that matter. It's not like the cliche creep who's hanging out at the playground. Yeah. Right? It's people we know. Yeah. It's, Trust. It's, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think, and a lot of it happens when people are younger, right? Like yeah. violations occur. Like maybe it is a teenage boy who violates a girl. He even grows up. Yeah. Has daughters. He has a wife. He has a beautiful home. He's an exec a studio or he's a you know critic at a newspaper they don't want to think about this they right. don't want to this they just want to yeah. you know i i also think because the numbers of women filmmakers is so abysmal i mean it hasn't changed there's a study that's 
come out, it was in 2022, of the last 16 years from 2007, when my film came out to 2022, the number of female directors in the top 100 films has stayed right about 8%. And has wow. Been- yeah. If you think about like 90 to 89 to 92% of our stories are being told by white men. Yeah. Maintaining the narrative that we live by, right? And I come in with this story that's not that, Mm -hmm. and it's not okay. It is not allowed. It is going to be silenced. And I always say, like, in a way, this, this shaming and silencing is more harmful than the actual event, right? Whether that was the rape or that was the telling of the story. Right. It's like I really felt like it was being it was happening again, like it was yeah. being violated in the same way. For and, sure. You know, it, it, even Dakota, I remember poor baby, like she was being interviewed at Sundance and her mother hadn't come because she was so traumatized. Her mother was being like people had petitions to have her mother arrested for child pornography. Right. Like. Mm-hmm. And her agent was being attacked. Everyone, it was being said, oh, they just wanted to use her for her Oscar. And there was a Saturday Night Live sketch about her, you know, and Abigail, um, I'm blanking on Abby's last name, uh, fighting over the Oscar, you know. um, She'd just done Nim. uh, But like the shaming that she might even want, she should have gotten nominated for an Oscar for that role. Of course she should have. And why can't she be ambitious as a young woman? And why can't she use her team and her mother? Like she's, you saw her performance. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. She knew what she was trying to do there. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember her saying that when she was asked, you know, in an interview there at Sundance and she said, the rape scene was not traumatic at all. What's traumatic is you all attacking my mother. That's traumatic. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was horrible what they did. Yeah. Mother. What, and she was so wise. She said, look, this happens to real girls all the time. This didn't happen to me. I was raped. I'm telling right. a story about young women who are raped right. every day. Don't yeah. you care about them? Don't you care about hearing their story? That's what I'm doing. I'm using my yeah. self as an artist to give voice to these stories that these women can't tell themselves, right? Right. Yeah. Why? And I think I think that's true. I mean, even in even in the real world, like rape is a fact. If that happens to you, that is a fact. That happened. Right. Period. And there's and there's, you know, it's a violation. There's so many things that you can feel as a result of that. But in its purest form, that is a fact. That is an event that happened. The real damage happens with the aftermath. Like there's this whole other layer of shame and pain on top of that That's one right. thing right. Um, that can snowball into years of additional trauma. And that's the crazy thing. And there it is, it is reflected in the experience of this actress in the film. Yeah. Um, just just once again. So I I really applaud you, Deborah, for putting it out there for enduring all of that, for continuing to tell the story in any way that you can, for then going on and making the next film, which was, I think, part of your fuck you campaign. (laughs) (laughs) And then now, you know, now I know you're working on raising a a billion dollar film fund um, so that women can have better voices. I'd love for you to share a little bit about that. But before we get to that, I have one more question kind of relating with the young woman um the hound dog theme which is how did you talk about what was happening with your daughter you said Sophia was five or six at the time when like mom's getting death threats over this movie that came out what was the dialogue around that and and maybe shed a little light on how you have you know what you have taught Sophia about you know being a woman in a man's world particularly in this industry yeah, I I didn't talk. I mean, I had a Patricia, the best. Sophia's like she's like my second daughter, and she was like Sophia's sister in a way. But she was with us. She was um, 
one of the several nannies that I had. And, you know, they were out throwing snowballs. I did not tell Sophia. Mm, Gotcha. Yeah. And luckily, you know, I wasn't arrested and I wasn't shot. Right. So she didn't even. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Wise. (laughs) I mean, she was on set uh, when I made Hound Dog the whole time. I remember the scene in the. um, The scene in the in the barn with Charles and Stranger Lady where they're sitting at the table and they're talking about mamas. Sophia hadn't been able to go to sleep that night. And even, you know, she would, uh, actually I had Alexander there. Uh, Patrizia came at the very end, but Alexander couldn't get Sophia to sleep that night. And she brought her to me in the loft and I was holding her uh, and she fell asleep in my arms and I was holding her for four hours and I was walking up and down the little steps that are there in Charles's room and going over and giving notes and going back up the step. And she was just there. Like she was part of my body, right? Yeah. Verbs and she was there, but nursing the whole time, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I had her there. I'd stopped nursing her right before uh, this film because I was like, there's no way I can. And she nursed for a long time. So there was no, I just felt like there's no way I can have enough energy to give her my milk and shoot this yep. film. So holding her, she was asleep four hours in my arms, up and down the stairs. At a certain point, Robin grabbed me, pulled me into her, and she says, no man will ever know what you're doing right now. And Fuck was, yeah. So true. Right? It was so true. Um, and it's just what I did. I, I remember on Virgin, I, um, you know, my, my car is in almost every scene because that was like a $65,000 film. And I would stop at 10 o'clock at night, nurse her to sleep, put her in Patricia's arms, roll the seat back, work till, you know, 2 a.m., drive home, sleep for a few hours, get up, you know, and it was just like, you know, she was on set with me all the time. Uh-huh. So I think it, I think in a way it's less about, I've certainly, you know, we talk about everything you know, now. And um, I mean, I don't think she would want me to go into too many details about like when I gave her the the sex ed talk and things like that. But, you know, I can say I did it early. I think I did it really brilliantly, you know, start with the clitoris, you know, that whole thing. But um, priorities, baby. <laughs> right. Like, that's it. You got to know that's the first point of entry. Uh, so, you know, there was all that. But I think more than talking to her about it, it was really her just being with me like mm-hmm. she was on every single set she was you know I was a single mom so and she was a single daughter so there was a very very close relationship and we just walked through the world together as best as we could yeah um you know and then at a certain age you do start talking the truth about things right um, yeah well and the truth is that the children will always learn more from watching how you live right anything you're going to tell them because how many people you know say one thing and do completely another well kids are smart and they are very observant totally Uh, so yeah i think i think her observing sophia observing you how you live how you work how you write how you direct all of those things even how you are in relationships with others um taught her a ton yeah regardless of what you said yeah she is splits her favorite film not just Mm -hmm. that i've made but ever right like Mm -hmm. she loves that film that film speaks to just about everything i have to say about being a woman right Mm -hmm. um and she was in that film i don't know if you realize she's the girl with the snakes on her head that goes down across from marish giggle oh i did not know that how did i miss that oh my god okay marish giggle saying my heart and she's repeating my heart and weeping and Erich Giggle says you know my vulva and Sophia is weeping and saying my vulva there's something transmuting there as well right like and Sophia was in that room Sophia wasn't naked but she was in that room with all those women's bodies of different sizes ages shapes yeah. Yeah. Right? like that she was immersed in yeah. that yeah. world and story uh right. in a very literal way right yeah it explains a lot about her actually <laughs> it makes much more sense why she is the yeah. icon that she already is at her young age so yeah. 
Um, yeah. So thank you for answering that question. Okay. So let's, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about what you're doing now about this, about this mission of yours. Fill us in on your new adventure, your big adventure. You know, it's been brewing for, for probably a decade, but a year ago it came right up to the front burner and, uh, became very clear. It was what I'm going to do, which is raise a billion dollar film fund to finance female filmmakers um, or female identified filmmakers. And, um, you know, the numbers, as I was saying before, just haven't changed. Yeah, They just don't change. And you can have Barbie like you had this year. Everyone's, oh, in shock that Barbie made a billion and a half dollars. It's like, well, what's the surprise there? It had a big budget like men get 200 yep. million yep. and it had a marketing campaign that no woman has ever had before. Yeah. Yeah. And the studies show there was a study done um, that showed that if a woman has as much money for her budget and as much money for her marketing, her films make just as much money, if not more than men. Right. right? Um but these numbers haven't changed. The activism hasn't changed anything. The, oh, giving women shadowing and, oh, giving women, we're still ghettoized to the little small budgets. So, of course, our films aren't going to do what men, men's films do. And then that continues the story that, oh, women's films don't make money. Women's mm-hmm. stories aren't, you know, like they're, they're not for the masses, right? So this, this, this makes me so crazy because it's like, it's it's one of those moments where a narrative is is so normalized that it's not questioned and it's like complete fiction it's out of it's not based on any truth it's yeah. based on um i don't know so, so, uh, maybe it's just purely we can call it the patriarchy generically but it's this complete falsehood that we all it's like the world is flat right Exactly. You know, and until someone is finally like screaming, dumping up and down and me like that, that is just not the case. Right. How can I show you this? Sorry, right. that's my a momentary rant there. I just had no, to say it, like it is not shit. Yeah. And I've made, you know, a beautiful presentation with all of those numbers and all of those statistics. Um, and also the women I want to support, I've got three levels. I've got late career women that include Women like um, uh, Julie Dash, who like made her first feature, was the first black woman to make a feature film that was released wide, is an icon and can't get any other films financed. Mm. Mm. Um, because of this, because of this untruth, this like yeah. belief. Yeah. Jane Campion. She made the piano. Mm-hmm. What it did in the world was so huge. She should have had the career Martin Scorsese had. Martin Scorsese yeah. made 27 films. Jane Campion has made eight. It took her 12 years between her second to last to her last film. It took her 12 years to get Power of the Dog made. Mm-hmm. It won her an Oscar, you know, I think because she had a male protagonist instead of a female protagonist, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, she's there. You know, I have a mid range of like mid career uh, women that include, you know, a filmmaker like Sofia Coppola. You'd say, well, why her? Isn't she doing great? She got a fraction of the budget that Baz Luhrmann got for Elvis. Same subject mm-hmm. matter. But I think it was a quarter of the budget she got. She lost two million dollars of financing right before she was he- Uh, going to shoot that she couldn't pull back together. So she had to cut 10 days out of her Mm. shooting schedule and 10 pages out of her script to Mm. get out a story. Whereas the guy got all the money to make it that he wanted. Right. Yeah. Like Ava DuVernay, that's changed the landscape of television that has been nominated for Oscars. She could not get financing for her film origin, which is out now. She had to go to philanthropists to get that money for that film. And now she doesn't have a marketing budget 
to properly campaign this film for the Oscar it deserves. It is a myth-changing film, and she can't get people to watch it. So she's on my list of filmmakers. Olivia Wilde, who if she was a man, she would be heralded as a great genius. Like, you know, I, I don't even know who to compare her to, Wes Anderson or uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. Or yeah. like, instead, all of the press around her is about how uh, she had an affair with Harry. And like, it's, it's just all about that. Instead yeah. of which, which also I think is bonus points for a male director. I totally, <laughs> totally it's with for a female. It's 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 it's, shame. it's shame again. And you know, or you look at someone like Mia DaCosta who made uh, Marvels, and uh, she, I think her budget was two hundred million, maybe two twenty, and she made like a hundred and eighty something, hundred and ninety something million back. In the press, she is called, her film's called A Flop. Mm. Martin Scorsese made Killers of the Flower Moon. Same budget level. The return on the investment was like 150-something million. Mm -hmm. In the press, his film's a huge success. Napoleon, mm -hmm. made for the same budget, brought in 79 million. His is in the press a triumph. Yeah, this this math is wrong. <laughs> like, it's just not adding up. <laughs> Mia should get to quote unquote fail. Okay, it didn't make its full money back, but it did pretty damn well. Mm -hmm. But it's a flop, and you look at the numbers of the men, and it's a totally different story. And that narrative means she won't get to make another movie like that. She won't get another budget like that. They can fail all they want and get the budget over and over and over again. And so that's why I want this film fund to support those women as well. And then you also have the le layer, the level of, you know, up and coming young women with vision and passion who are just begging for financing and make their films for a hundred thousand or three million. And, you know, maybe they'll be lucky and get into Sundance. But, you know, there was a, a study done that I was a part of. Uh, and again, like all these statistics I've given you are from Stacy Smith at the Annenberg Institute. And she's been so passionate and I'm so grateful to her for doing these numbers. But she did a study of what happens to the women who go to Sundance, who are nominated for the grand jury prize. And she studied okay. between 2000 and 2010. What happens to their careers? You know, spoiler alert, nothing. Every guy who gone with a grand jury nomination has a five picture deal at Miramax or wherever, right? right? And and you know, these young men do one short and they're given a fifty million dollar budget to go make a feature that they flop. You know, like we have so many women who are so like seasoned and skilled and they need the money. And it's like if you're gonna change the narrative of society, because entertainment is how we as a society, sit around the campfire and tell our stories and create our myths and create the future that we're going to live. The myths we tell today, the stories we tell today are what we live tomorrow. We are shaping that. And again, if 92% of those stories are being told by white men, yeah. that's the culture we're going to continue to sort of. make happen, right? Yeah. And it's yeah. not to be just Two or three films by women a year are not going to change that. We have to flood. Yeah. We have to flood the, you know, landscape with so many stories by women because we have to grow those ears I was talking about. And yeah. The to yeah. do them is hear the story again and again. Because yeah. once you come out and the decision makers and the gatekeepers are saying, uh, I don't know, it doesn't do anything for me. They don't get right. it. Right. And, yeah. And and you keep the seeds that were the things that we're seeing now are the seeds that were planted, you know, back then. So right. the seeds we're planting now are what we will what we will reap in the future. And so to your point, yeah, then the, nothing changes unless things change and they can't just change with like a pink, a little drop, you know. Yeah. And I don't know that it's conscious. I don't actually think it is. But the people telling this story, it's the last frontier. 
It really is. We have a lot of women lawyers, a lot of women doctors, a lot of women, you know, astronauts. The final frontier is the story. You change the story, you change the world. And it's like they are holding it with tight fists. They do not want to let go. They yeah. do not want to let go because the moment they let go, their world is going to change. Yeah. It's like the last frontier. But spoiler alert, it will change for the better, friend. Give it a try. <laughs> you know? If you and I know this, I they, they don't know it. Yeah. I mean, because that's the thing, right? I don't think that's the surprise. We yeah. aren't trying to obliterate. Like, I don't want to eliminate men's stories. I just write 50% of women's stories out there, right? Yeah, 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 totally. What? So I, women's stories, I mean, some of them are going to hate the men, but a lot of them are going to worship the men, right? Yes. Yes. The full range. I mean, just like the reverse right. is true. You know, like how many of the stories written and told by men are pro-female and how many, you know, put us in a little box and paint us into certain, you know, these three archetypes and that's it. Right. So um, more range, you know, more, mm -hmm. more color, more flavors, more spices. Yeah. I love that. So Deborah, for, for someone who's listening to this and inspired by your journey, your passion, certainly about this topic, about you know, the ability to express truth and, and to change the, the narrative of cultural storytelling, what, what, would you, what would you give as a piece of advice on an individual level? Like on an individual level, what can I as a woman listening to this do to be more true, to contribute to those seeds that we're planting for the larger change that we want to see in the world? Well, as I was saying before, just get it out, get it out, mm -hmm. whisper it out, scream it out, vomit it out. I mean that, like puke it the fuck out, but get it out of you. And um, I don't think just into a garbage can, right? I think <laughs> to, your, to your girlfriend, to your therapist, I mean, for me personally on the page is the greatest gift because then I can transmute it into a story, but to write every day. And, you know, I always say like, you know, you can start with a prompt or whatever, but I think for me, the most powerful like prompt when I'm trying to journal is what I really want to say is. Mm -hmm. mm, I like that. Stuck, right. If I, if I have a prompt and I'm writing and then, and, and I also love the, you know, writing down the bones and Natalie Goldberg of the exercise of just not letting the pen stop. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if you read my journals, the number of pages where it's like, I don't know what the fuck to say. Fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> okay. How many more pages do I have? How many more minutes? And I just write fuck for, you know, 10 minutes and that's all I yeah. do. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like people think, oh, it's got to be beautiful on the page. No, I'm just like, so if I'm in the middle of my third page of fuck, 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 I'll just slip in a little. What I really want to say is I don't fucking know what I really want to say. If I knew what I really want to say, I would have said something more than fuck. So go fuck yourself. I don't know what I want to fucking say. <laughs> and then I'll write again. What I really want to say is I don't know. What I really want to say is, you know, this morning when I got out of bed and my fingers were stiff, it scared the fuck out of me. Is my like, is my immune system attacking myself again? And am I going to die? I don't fucking want to die. I have so much fucking work to do. I don't want to fucking die. Please don't let me die. Please don't let, you know, like. Yeah, and, yeah. And so like just allowing yourself to get into the place of vomit. Like I really do like to call it vomit because like I think people sit down to say something important. And you're never going to be able to say anything if you're trying to say something important. But if you let yourself um, write shit, write vomit, vomit it on the page, then there'll be little gems in there for you to scoop up Yeah. and start a new page with the little gems. I like to, after I've done, you know, a timed writing to go through and underline a few things that I like and start my next timed writing with those as my prompt. Those right? things. Brilliant. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Um, those are great tips for, for sure, the writers, but for all humans, like if you do any kind oh, of perfect. journaling, what a beautiful way to, yeah, excavate the truth that lives within. 
you know, and to not worry about taking up space, but just to like purge. So good. Yeah. So my last question for you is if someone listening to this wants to invest in your billion dollar fund, we'll definitely put in the show notes, we'll put links to all of your films so people can right. get to know your work better. But in terms of the fund, is there uh, a preferred way for folks to reach out to you? Sure. Um, you can go to my website. Um, actually, my website is DeborahCantmeyer.com. I'm not sure if there's anything on there, but go to info at, so just send an email to info at com. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. We'll put that in the show notes too. So people driving don't have to worry about how to spell it. Yeah. <laughs> if you have a billion um, dollars, you know, and would like just to just Venmo it <laughs> and would like to sit down for dinner with me, then send me a note at VIP at com. Oh, love it. Love it. Well, I hope that your inbox is flooded with dinner invitations and fat checks and offers to Venmo money and, and to just bring this to life because it's such, there, there's so many beautiful and important stories to be shared and um, you were the woman to do it in my heart and in my mind. So thank, thank you for being here today and sharing some of your wisdom and your brilliance and your passion. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you to my audience for joining us. And uh, we'll be back next week for another episode of the podcast. Until then, have a marvelous fucking week. Mwah. Thank you. Thank you.